it's time for our next episode of Leadership Talks. We're joined today by Claire Hahn, who joins us from University of Texas System. And she first started working with us when she worked for University of Texas at Austin. Mm -hmm. And she gave a great talk on mindful leadership for our uh, leadership growth program. And then she gave a, this, another talk uh, on that subject for our leadership growth program this year. And I thought, well, let's try and share that with some more people. So we're so happy to have you. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Yeah, it's an honor to be here. Oh, thanks. So we, we do this in a, a kind of a systematic way. We have three standard questions that I ask you in the beginning and then three standard questions I ask you at the end. And in between, we have a sort of a targeted subject that we cover in this case, um, mindfulness and specifically mindful leadership. So to start, the first question is in two minutes or less, uh, tell us your career story. How did you get to where you are today professionally? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's kind of funny given what we're going through right now, because when I was younger, I saw that movie Outbreak and that combined with my parents being in healthcare really made me want to work at the Center for Disease Control. Oh. So I did end up studying public health and I worked at CDC. I wasn't in a hazmat suit working with viruses, but I was working on teen pregnancy prevention there for about three years. And then when I moved back to Austin, I really just needed a job and the health department had a grant to start the Austin Business Group on Health. And um, they hired me to help with that process. And through that, I got to know different wellness managers and coordinators at employers throughout Austin and was able to apply those public health program skills to that work. And as that grant was ending, uh, luckily a position at UT Austin opened up in the Health Point Wellness Program and HR. So I worked at UT Austin for about seven years. And then about two years ago, I transitioned over to UT System. And now I help support all 14 UT campuses in the wellness program. So it's been really fun getting to work with everyone. That's great. And I remember um, you telling a story about your, your, your kind of meditation and mindfulness journey. You've done a lot of work uh, in, in studying that area too. Yeah, so in between Atlanta, working at the CDC, and coming back to Austin, uh, well, I got real involved in yoga and meditation in Atlanta, and then I went to India and did a Vipassana meditation training. It's 10 days, completely silent. You're not talking to anyone. Um, it's just so weird because you have a roommate that you don't talk to. Um, you meditate for you know two hours in the morning, then you have breakfast, you meditate for more hours, followed by lunch, and a few more hours of meditation. My gosh. Just like a marathon for the mind, but you don't have to do that to be a mindful leader. Right. <laughs> Good. It's, uh, wow. Just, I mean, just the two hours part in the morning is, is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So what does leadership mean to you? Yeah. So I really love Brene Brown's definition. She talks about a leader is anyone who recognizes potential in people and processes and has the courage to develop that potential. I like that because a leader can be anyone. Uh, you don't have to have direct reports. It can be on a project or process. And she talks about taking responsibility. So to me, that's really action-oriented um, choice and agency. And then having that courage, because it can't be tough um, as a leader to make the right decision and follow through on that. And for me right now, personally, leadership is about making a meaningful contribution. To remember that during these times. And, you know, through my mindfulness training and other trainings, um, some of my leadership principles that I'm leading by now are, you know, integrity and honesty, also fun, creativity, and abundance. That's great. That, so that's the definition that we use to our leadership growth program. And for those, those very reasons that you you state because it, it doesn't, it's not a necessarily about direct reports or your position. You can be a leader by just making a, a big difference in the world. Yeah. So with that in mind, uh, what do you suspect or know bothers people about you as a leader um, or what is your leadership weakness? Well, I really hate conflict and I try and avoid it at all costs. So I know it's definitely a weakness. But I think mindfulness um, has helped me address that. One, because it just changes what I see as a conflict. Um, things I used to see as conflict before aren't really conflicts. They're more opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, just respond in a different way. Okay, great. 
Okay, let's get into the heart of it. What is mindfulness? I mean, fun fundamentally, how does one how does one practice it? A lot of people who will be tuning into this already probably have a, a general idea of mindfulness, but yeah. I still want to still want to cover it just before we get into mindful leadership. No, it's a great question to define it and kind of set the stage. So I think a formal definition of mindfulness is just um, non-judgmental present moment awareness. And I can break this down, take the second half first, that present moment awareness. So being present in the moment, uh, kind of noticing, you know, what's going on in the external environment, but then also internally, what, what are your thoughts, your feelings, and then the sensations in your body. And then that first part is about non-judgmental. So we're not judging what's happening at the time. We're just really open to it. We have a willingness to kind of just be with what's there, accept it. And just kind of get curious and playful with it. Um, you know, maybe I notice tension in my shoulders or neck, but I'm just like, oh, I didn't notice. I hadn't noticed that before. You know, what does that mean? What can that, um, what, what does that mean? Or how can that change how I react? So I think, you know, if you don't like the word mindfulness, I think Brene Brown says it gets on her nerves. So she just calls it paying attention. And it is paying attention. <laughs> And um, Ellen Longer from Harvard, she talks about, you know, mind, mindlessness versus mind. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing something mindlessly, it's hard because you don't know you're not there um, in the moment so to be more present. Um, and then, you know, you asked about kind of fundamentally, how do we practice this? Mm -hmm. There's a few different steps, but we'll walk through just an example. Um, back when we used to commute in our cars and there was a lot of traffic, you know, maybe someone cut you off. You got angry and you flicked them off. And just kind of we're in these habits. We're just in cycles, autopilot. We're stressed out, just trying to get through the day. Um, but mindfulness can kind of break that habit at any point. So the first step is really just noticing and acknowledging like, oh, I am really tense. My fists are clenching the steering wheel. Um, and I feel it tense in my chest. So just kind of noticing, oh, and then getting curious and acknowledging. Yeah, I feel tense right now. And then just recentering. Reese coming back to the breath, maybe taking a deep breath or feeling your feet on the floor of the car, wherever you are. And then that just kind of opens you up for other possibilities rather than just your knee jerk reaction of getting upset with that person. Maybe you just kind of wish them well, send them a little wave, and just be appreciative that we're commuting again. Um, <laughs> this kind of opens the playing field as to what's possible there. It's a good example. I think we've all been there. All been there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what are some common misunderstandings or misconceptions that you think people have about mindfulness? Yeah. Well, I'm also a yoga teacher. One misconception there is that you have to be flexible. Don't have to be flexible to do yoga. And I would say with med with mindfulness is that you don't that you have to not have any thoughts, that your mind has to be clear. But that's not what mindfulness is. It's mindfulness practice is really about practicing bringing your attention back to the present moment. So it's like, how quickly can you notice that your mind has drifted? And then how can it quickly can you bring it back to this moment? So it's just a practice. It's not about not having thoughts, just about noticing those thoughts coming back to the present moment. I think also um, people say that mindfulness might be kind of woo-woo or soft, but I think there's a lot of evidence now and research that shows mindfulness has a positive effect on people's health and productivity and work. And, um, you know, some people say they don't have time to practice mindfulness, but I think we'll talk later about, you know, how you can integrate it into your everyday life and it doesn't have to be um, some big burden, another thing to do. Okay, good. So over the year, I know you've been doing this for a long time and, and even, you know, with leadership, uh, you, uh, you've been looking at mindfulness for quite a while. Over the years, how have you seen the concept or the practice evolve in particular in the workplace? Yeah. Um, well, I think even the fact that we're having this conversation now wouldn't have happened right. maybe 10 years ago. So that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think 10 years ago, you know, we always had this holistic picture of health and wellness and worksite wellness, but really the main focus was on physical health and nutrition. And I think now mindfulness is being recognized as just as important as those two other components. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we've had physical activity challenges in the past, but our spring challenge this year is about what's called work of art and it's about boosting happiness and resilience and mindfulness is definitely a component of that. So to see that in a mainstream challenge is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, yoga is also mindfulness practice and there's more and more yoga classes at work sites. 
And I think even as we transitioned to working from home, you know, yoga classes got up and running on Zoom very quickly. So that was great. People are still encouraging mindfulness in that way. I know at the Employee Assistance Program at UT Austin, there's a stress reduction and biofeedback center. So a whole room and space dedicated to mindfulness. Um, so I just think, you know, it's finally gaining some traction and there's these types of trainings in my seminars and conferences I teach and organize and always integrate some kind of mindfulness practice. And I don't think people are surprised anymore. I think that's just part of um, how we're operating now. Yeah, right now, the virtual yoga sessions at UT Austin are the most popular um, courses that we're offering. Fabulous, yeah. 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 And yeah, that transition happened really quickly. It's amazing how fast people responded and um, provide some resources. Yeah. So now we're living in a new world uh, in a lot yeah. of ways. What role do you think that mindfulness can or should play as we sort of adapt to these, this new environment um, that brought on to us by this pandemic? Yeah, it's unprecedented in so many ways and just kind of uprooted everything about life in all aspects. Uh, I think mindfulness can help in a couple of ways. One is that physical health. Um, you know, we're under a lot of stress right now and mindfulness can really help us kind of reduce stress. It can help with reducing fatigue, um, burnouts, and then also um, can help lower blood pressure. So I think mm-hmm. contributing to our mental health and well-being and physical health. Um, it can also help with focus. I think it's been really hard to concentrate with just so many changes and every day there's something new and every day is uncertain, but mindfulness has a positive impact on focus. And I think moving forward, you know, these are new, new times. Uh, we're going to need new solutions. And mindfulness can help us kind of have that creativity and that open, we're open and willing to kind of see what's there and be with it. Um, new ideas come out of that. And, you know, I think mindfulness also has positive effects on relationships. And whether that's a work relationship or now you're at home with your family 24 um, seven with added pressure, it can, or you're relating to your coworkers, you know, via Zoom and never seeing them in person, that's a change too. So mindfulness can help with improve those relationships. Yeah, I think one through the kind of the cadence or the, the flow of, of work mm-hmm. over this, this period, and sometimes it just feels like it's constant. A lot of people, yes. uh, present, present company included, are also parenting. Right. while they're trying to do their work. And I think it's just this constant noise in a lot of ways of right. just reaction, reaction, reaction. And that's why I think mindfulness can be really helpful to just to sort of force you to, to take a pause and sort of get your bearings instead of just being overwhelmed constantly. Right. And yeah, um, Mark Lesser, he developed the program at Google. And he also has a program on an app, uh, the, the mindfulness program at Google. But he talks about know, having mindful transitions. So I know you can't always decide when you're transitioning from work to family, uh, if you get interrupted, but having like a little transition, being mindful of that transition. Now I'm working and now I'm going to transition into a family time or Mm -hmm. whatever the next thing is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's start talking about mindful leadership specifically. What, what does mindful leadership mean? Yeah, I like, um, it's a book called Finding the Space to Lead, Janet Martin. Um, Sorry, what was the author's name? Janet Marturano, Find okay. Space to Lead, yeah. And she talks about um, mindful leadership as leadership who embodies um, leadership presence by cultivating focus, clarity, creativity, and compassion in the service of others. And, um, you know, those in this changing time, we definitely need those, those abilities, that focus and clarity creativity, and also compassion. Um, I like that she talks about that leadership presence, because if you think about leaders that you admire, uh, and they have, they definitely have a positive presence about them, and I think I was thinking back to those leaders, and I can see how they um, have all of those traits there with them, but I just want to give a little example of how mindfulness can be applied at, at work, and, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, we're on autopilot, we're just operating in our habits, so maybe like a coworker comes to you and wants to do a new project or do something in a different way. And you're like, 
your immediate reaction is, this is going to be way more work for me. Why now? No, we can't do it. So we're just, you know, we're stressed and we're just trying to stay afloat. Um, but mindfulness can kind of help intervene at any point in that situation. So the event happens, somebody comes to you and they're asking for this new change. And then you have a judgment or thought or feeling. And maybe you just notice like a uh, heaviness, uh, a feeling of this is not good for me. <laughs> this is going to be too much of a burden. And, and when you practice mindfully, you really notice that you're like, okay, I feel this in my chest. I, this is, I'm really surprised. Like this was my first reaction. I didn't think I would say I'd respond so quickly to say no. And then just recentering, coming back to your breath. It doesn't have to be anything dramatic, but just simply noticing your feet on the floor and the inhale and exhale. And maybe that, you know, you get curious with what's there and you can say, tell me more about that. Or how would that, how would that look? Um, so even if you don't decide to do the new thing, you know, there's some more compassion in that way. So that's how mindfulness can kind of intervene in our work lives and leadership. You touched on it a little bit. Can you talk a little bit more about why uh, mindful leadership is important or why it can be, you know, powerful? Yeah. Um, even before we got into these, the pandemic, the military had termed this, or coined this term VUCA world. And VUCA stands for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I mean, I can't think of a better example than what we're going through right now. I mean, everything is uncertain, ambiguous, new, different. Um, and mindful, and I think humans, you know, we're conditioned to feel uncomfortable when there's uncertainty. So mindfulness can help us kind of navigate that change, can help us recognize um, our own uncertainty and fears and kind of see things, you know, take a step back and more openly and honestly see clearly what's in front of us. And then again, kind of having that focus and being open to that creativity um, to move forward. And I think um, mindfulness is mindful leadership um, is also important for building connections. Um, Jana also mentions that our ability to lead is directly, to lead with excellence is directly affected by our ability to connect and skillfully and initiate and meet change. Um, so that connection piece can really be helpful with mindfulness. One example is uh, mindful listening. It's also called active listening. But when you're, you're fully present, your mind is not wandering to what you're going to do this weekend or if or when you can get to the grocery store, um, but really listening to what the other person is saying, not even thinking about what you're going to say next, but giving your full attention to that person. I kind of do this with my husband. Like, I, I feel like I always feel like I know what he's going to say next. So I'm thinking, maybe I'll be surprised. Like, who knows? I'm going to be open to whatever comes next. Uh, so that's mindful listening. Uh, mindful leadership can also, is so closely tied with emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is kind of a big word for saying like emotional intelligence is the ability to know ourselves, our own feelings and behaviors, how well we know other people. And then using that, um, ability, using that um, knowledge to manage how we manage, change how we manage our behavior and manage our relationships. So mindfulness definitely helps with that self-awareness piece of um, noticing your own thoughts, feelings, and patterns and how you respond, which is the first step to making that change. And finally, I think mindful leadership or mindfulness is so important during this time. Just leaders are under immense stress and pressure, and that pressure can become, you know, kind of chronic or extreme. And mindfulness can be a key to that rest and recovery. I mean, even taking, you know, a short break, mindful break can um, help with that recovery and getting out of that fight and flight kind of pattern that we may be in with all the stress. So we're probably not going to reach the audience we need to reach with this next question. But uh, for those leaders who say, I don't, I don't have time for this right now, especially right now with the crisis, all I have time to do is put out fires constantly all day. Yeah. Um, mindfulness <laughs> is the last thing on my mind. What, what would you say to those people? I know, right? Who wants one more thing to do? <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of like exercise. We all know how important it is and how great it would be to exercise every day, but it's definitely easier said than done. Uh, the good thing about mindfulness is, you know, you don't have to spend 30 minutes in silence every morning to have to practice mindfulness. Um, Mark Lesser at Google says there's a dedicated practice and integrated mindfulness practice. And that dedicated one would be the 30 minutes on a cushion in the morning. But the integrated one 
is actually just make, create weaving mindfulness into your current life and activities. So for example, I would invite them to pick one activity that they do every day. Right now, washing your hands is a good one because we're doing so much. So if you want an intense mindfulness practice, choose something you do frequently. And every time you wash your hands, let that be the cue to think, to remember, I'm going to do this mindfully. And what I mean by that is really using, you know, your five senses to be fully present. So maybe you notice the temperature of the water, uh, maybe the scent of the soap, um, the feeling, you know, the feeling of how your body's standing at the sink or how the towel feels, uh, what you're thinking in that moment. So just take those everyday activities and do them mindfully. If you pick brushing your teeth, you know, you brush your teeth two minutes in the morning, you do that mindfully, uh, noticing the toothpaste, the feeling of the toothbrush, and you do that two minutes in the evening, you've already done four minutes of mindfulness and haven't had to add anything in. So I think just kind of integrating it in is the easiest way to do it. Good. I've yeah, seen it in my advice. own life how doing those small things can later in the day have an impact. You do, you are faster to notice when your mind has wandered. So I invite just to practice it and see how it works. I can't, I don't remember who this is attributed to, but um, somebody said, uh, if, if you hear, if you think that you don't have time to meditate for 10 minutes a day, then your the advice is then you should meditate for 20 minutes a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I think it's the same thing with mindfulness. And also, I think it helps that that sort of incremental growth, like so many right. things with mindfulness. If you start doing it for two minutes here and two minutes there, maybe you'll find that you actually have time to do it more throughout the day. Yeah. And having that trigger, like I know once you, you know, if you're, you brush your teeth and then you, you're mindful, just like right. the alarm you get up or something. Right. Healthy habit triggers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so can you give us uh, some examples where you've seen mindfulness make a significant impact on a leader? Yeah, I think uh, makes me think of Mark Bertolini, who works at Aetna. Um, he developed a, a really solid and intense mindfulness practice in his life. But he talked about, you know, as he did that, he slept better. He was more effective, more mindful. And as he began to implement that at his work, the meetings got shorter. Um, he was more mindful and present during them. There was less reworking also, so people were making less mistakes. And then people just, you know, his compassion built and people appreciate his leadership more. So I think those are, those are some of the general examples of what mindful leadership can do, but I'll share a specific one too um, that Janet talks about. And this was about, there was an executive at a company who kind of volunteered to take over this employee. She saw potential in her, but the employee was struggling. Um, so the executive, you know, offered to mentor her. And, you know, the executive was really busy. And this particular day, um, she arrived late from the flight, but she made every effort to make the meeting with the employee. And they got, she got to the meeting and the employee was basically like, I haven't done anything. <laughs> and the executive, you know, she instantly she's noticed I got so tense, the heat rising, the anger building. And in that moment, she was able just to refocus with her feet on the floor and take a breath. And I think, you know, typically she would have reacted kind of with rage, but she was even surprised herself. Instead, she asked, you know, are you okay? And by doing that, it changed the conversation it changed the direction that um, the relationship went and what happened it doesn't excuse not doing the work but uh, it opens up a new path forward new opportunities um, so I think that's just kind of maybe a subtle but profound way that it can impact day-to-day -day relationships and meaning so you talked about how to incorporate mindfulness throughout your day mm -hmm. um, how, how would you recommend though somebody in particular uh, leaders how would, how would you recommend they start the practice of mindfulness? Yeah, I think I would, yeah, in addition to integrating it throughout your day, um, you know, I think Eileen Fisher talks about this, who started Eileen Fisher clothing, but, you know, trying every hour to just pause and check in with yourself, whether that's setting a reminder on your calendar um, every hour or even just at lunchtime, just take a pause, notice your breathing, and maybe you ask just, what am I experiencing right now? Um, 
And I think as you slowly start to build this, it becomes more of a habit, but it does take some reminding and constant <laughs> effort as well. Along those same lines, um, and also taking into consideration our current circumstances, mm -hmm. a lot of things, anxiety that people are feeling, what advice do you have for leaders who are struggling to be mindful or, or practice mindfulness? Um, is there, is there something that you think could, could help them? Even if it's people who in the past have practiced mindfulness and suddenly realized they just, they cannot, um, can't do it right now. Yeah, I know it's unprecedented times and stress in all different in new ways. Um, I would really recommend just having some self-compassion. Um, Kristen Neff, who works at UT Austin, is the expert mm -hmm. in the field. But, you know, it's a difficult time for everyone. Um, and just in general, I think, you know, part of the human experience is some suffering and noticing that we're, we, we all experience that. And just being really kind to yourself, um, you know, acknowledge how you feel and treat yourself with care. But some other things also are just um, practicing savoring. Um, if you do go for a walk, can, how can you savor that walk? Really appreciate what you see. One way is just to try and notice five new things, um, but being present there. You can also do this with a meal you're gonna be eating anyway. Can you really savor that um, meal that you're having? Um, be present there, really taste the food. And you know, we don't wanna add to people's to-do lists, but if you can having, you know, just starting with a little bit of gratitude or getting back to a little bit of gratitude, maybe writing three things at the end of the day about what you're grateful for, or just sending a text or email um, telling someone thanks. Um, and also kind of remind us of the positive things that are happening. Were you talking about, uh, and I think it was in the same line as a savoring, yeah. noticing, noticing um, just sort of different things about people that you're familiar with, like your partner as they're talking and just sort of paying attention to different things that you may not have really noticed before. And I really like that, that idea. Yeah. I, you know, initially when I heard about this noticing thing, it was like, notice five things around you, but yeah, like you said, you can start doing it with your spouse, your kids, friends, kind of noticing. It just helps you be more present in the conversation, mm -hmm. noticing, um, five new things about them that you hadn't noticed before. Yeah, I like that idea. Uh, we're gonna have just some time for the, the closing questions. I want to, people who are tuning in right now, Claire has mentioned um, some, some great resources, books, and uh, other mindfulness experts. And uh, if you have questions along those lines, Claire, at some other time, she'll be able to go into the comments of, this, of the Facebook feed, if, if that's where you're watching it and um, answer those comments as she has time. And we, we don't usually have time to actually um, respond to comments in the Facebook feed during the interview, but we hopefully will eventually get to most of them um, at some point. You, you, some people might be watching this video recorded at a later date, but if you want to um, get to the comment section, go to the HR Facebook page uh, for the University of Texas. So first question, Claire, and the last last three questions as we close, what are you reading right now? Yeah, I I really love, on my commute, I used to listen to books in the car. So I do miss that, don't miss the driving, but I was listening to uh, Rabbit. It's, by, it's a memoir of Patricia Williams. She grew up in a troubled neighborhood in Atlanta and she eventually became a comedian. So it's definitely heart-wrenching, but also humorous at times. And I'm also reading Where the Crawl Dad Sing, um, it's beautiful and just a good escape from the day to day. That's what, uh, in Adrian's uh, interview, uh, the AVP of, of HR, I thought she was reading that book as well. As I'm well slow to time. catch up. I know everybody's read it. <laughs> do it now. <laughs> what, was, what was the hardest thing that you've had to do as a leader? Oh, um, you know, I, I really like having a lot of creativity and new ideas and like the freedom to pursue those at work. Um, but once a coworker came to me and wanted to pursue this new project um, and being wanting to be supportive, I said, okay, let's, let's do the, you know, let's go ahead and pursue the project. Um, but it became clear just the timing wasn't going to work out. It wasn't a good fit at the, at that time with what we had going on. 
So eventually I had to pull the plug on the project and you know, it was really hard because I really want to support people's creativity and passion and autonomy and new ideas. Um, but, you know, balancing that with what was happening, um, it wasn't the best time to do, but it's just so hard because I really want to be supportive of that because mm -hmm. I appreciated that. Yeah, that's a good lesson. Uh, last question. Give us two key pieces of leadership advice. Okay, two key ones. One, keep practicing mindfulness. <laughs> um, my other one right now that I've been working with is just kind of remembering your why. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, my why is making a meaningful contribution, um, helping people lead a ha healthy, ha happy and healthy life, and reach their full potential. But I think during this time, there's been so many distractions and a lot, when all these things are happening, so much can seem futile too. So focusing on the why has been helpful for me. So maybe that'll help someone else. That's great. Thank you so much, Claire. Thanks yeah, for joining thank us. Stay safe here. and well and uh, please keep in touch. I will. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody.